Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host, Michelle Anderson, Digital Managing Editor of The Horse. Tonight we're talking about insect control for horse farms. But before we get started, we at The Horse have a special offer for Ask the Horse Live listeners. Subscribe to our print magazine and get 75% off the cover price at askthehorse.com slash askthehorseoffer. That's just $15 for a one-year subscription, 12 issues per year. You'll get vetted, accurate healthcare information every month throughout the year. Okay, so back to insect control. Bugs are beyond annoying for horses. Insects spread diseases, some of them deadly, and can cause irritating and performance limi limiting allergic reactions. We're gonna spend the next hour answering your questions about protecting horses from mosquitoes, gnats, biting flies, ticks, and more. And we are joined by Dr. Erica McTinger, who is an entomologist and extension specialist at Pennsylvania State University. Welcome, Dr. McTinger. Thank you. So, can you tell us a little bit about your interest in insect and vector control, particularly for horses, because it's a very specialized segment of research and, um, and academics. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I've grown up riding horses, uh, over 30 years now that I have been riding horses and uh, had my own small farm for a little while. Um, I currently have, you know, a horse of my own still that I uh, find time to ride even through all this academic stuff that I, <laughs> that I do. Um, so I knew when I went uh, to grad school that I was going to be wanting to put two of my interests, which are insects and horses together and, and do research on an industry, the horse industry, which is really underserved uh, in many ways in agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to do that. And I think it's it's unique from my perspective because I'm able to look at some of the problems that horse owners have, both as a horse owner myself and as an expert in, in entomology, so I can see a little bit more what would be practical and what's really not, which isn't always the case with some of expert recommendations. Mm -hmm. So other entomologists who are looking at insect and vector control, where would they focus their specialty interest? Is it with humans or um, other livestock? That's an excellent question. So uh, if you think way back to before the automobile, horses were a major part of our transportation. Uh, and so they were considered livestock. But since the since Henry Ford came around with, with motor vehicles, they're no longer considered livestock and are companion animals. So we don't have a strong lobbying group for research because they don't produce anything. Now we know the value of them, but in terms of what the USDA considers um, products, they don't actually produce products. So most of the veterinary entomologists are focused on uh, the beef cattle industry, dairy, poultry, a uh, few into in swine, um, what what the USDA really looks at as livestock, honeybees are considered livestock, but horses are not. Even though they're still under the purview of the USDA, they're not considered livestock. So a lot of our insect control information actually comes from other industries that we try and roll over to work in horse facilities. But we all know that horse farms are very different from cattle facilities and, and poultry facilities. So it doesn't it doesn't always cross over. Well, and what I think is really interesting about this topic is that it affects all of us who have horses. It doesn't matter if you have, you know, your backyard pony for your grandkids or you're talking about your high-end hunter jumper horse um, or everything, you know, in between. We all deal with flies driving us crazy and also protecting our horse from these vector-borne diseases. Do you, in in your work, who are you mostly focused on helping? Is it you know, your small backyard owner or larger farms? Uh, again, a really good question because it really, it depends on who's seeking help. Um, it's probably more in the middle. So your, your commercial boarding facilities, uh, occasionally we'll have private ho uh, horse owners who have their five acre farmettes ask questions. The larger, if you think Kentucky thoroughbred farms generally have their own in-house expert that does their their pest control so we don't usually get uh ideas or, or interest from them to work on those farms but it's not um 
it's not out of the ordinary for us to get a variety of different folks coming and asking questions. Now, the challenge with horse facilities versus, say, dairy cattle is that the husbandry practices really change based on uh, how big the facility is or how many horses they have, um, what their what their focus is, so the hunter jumpers are very different in how they manage their horses versus, say, an event barn. Um, they share some similarities, but they're not always the same. So that that is really a challenge for us, really knowing what's going on versus the dairy cattle or the beef cattle or the poultry, which tend to have very industry standard husbandry practices. So it can be a little bit of a, a challenge. It's fun. It's fun to kind of figure out what's going on, but <laughs> but it can be a challenge. <laughs> yeah. So for Ask the Horse Live, for everyone who's listening, I just want to review our format a little bit. We're going to be starting with the questions everyone submitted during registration. If you have a question, you're listening live, or you would like clarification on a response, you can enter that in the ch chat window in front of you. We're going to do our best to get to as many questions of yours as possible from the live audience. I also want to note um, that uh, Dr. McTinger, and maybe you can help clarify this a little bit. So you, you're not a veterinarian, you're an entomologist. So we're going to really try to focus the questions tonight on managing insects and um, epidemiology and the insects themselves and not on the clinical signs in your horse if they do get sick or any treatment uh, type things. Those would be more appropriate for, for your veterinarian. Uh, Dr. McTinger, did I sum that up? appropriately yeah so i uh, i always tell folks whether i'm talking about ticks or flies or whatever the case may be that that my professional jurisdiction ends once that fly or, or tick has actually bitten or landed on your animal i can talk about what can be transmitted and the potential risks but in terms of diagnosis and treatment that is definitely a, a veterinary professionals uh area of expertise <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so we'll talk about how a tick can um, carry Lyme disease and pass it on, but not then how that's going to affect your horses to everyone right. listening. So yeah, so let's go ahead and jump in. And our first question is, is you know, the, the biggie uh, as far as f stable flies go. It's from Monica in Ontario, Canada, and she wants to know, how do we discourage stable flies uh, from being in our barns? Okay, so that's a great place to start because it opens up several pieces that when we talk about fly control, we need to kind of lay the foundation for. And that is whenever I talk about control on a farm, I always think about it from what we call an integrated pest management perspective, IPM perspective, which is a standard series of kind of common sense approaches to pest management that really maximizes your control but minimizes risks to the environment and to people. Uh, and so this is ways that we bring in different methods of control to do that. But the problem with flies is that they're small, they seem to be everywhere, and they all kind of look the same. But the, the issue is that they're not all the same. So there's several species of flies that are really involved in, in being pests on our farms. And stable flies, like you said, are, are one of those. So the first piece of IPM is to identify the pest that you have. And a lot of folks get confused because they hear the name sta stable fly and they think that means it's the flies in the stable. And actually stable flies don't actually like to go indoors. House flies will, they'll hang out in your barns, but stable flies don't. So I wanna just lay that groundwork that I am going to actually talk about stable flies when I answer this question, but we need to make sure that for those of you listening that you are truly identifying which fly you have because the control methods are not the same for house flies, stable flies, face flies, horn flies, all those major fly groups that, that are pests of horses. So stable so, fly, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so the flies that move into my house that I always blame on my horses, are those actually not here because of my horses? It depends, again, so um, you may be talking about cluster flies, which are, they look a little bit like house flies, they're kind of slow moving and, and dark colored. They're big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are they kind of shiny? Yeah, round. Yeah, okay. they're round. Yep. They kind of bumble around. Yeah. Yep. So they're probably cluster flies, which are related to uh, what we call blow flies, which are uh, the bright, shiny colored flies that we see sometimes mm -hmm. around horse, fly or horse farms or dumpsters. Um, and they actually are not caused by your horses. They live in the okay. soil and they eat earthworms. So, so okay. they're, they're a little bit more of a challenge to deal with than our on-farm flies, which are really... 
uh, their presence is there because of the animals. Um, and in your case, cluster flies are a little bit different of, a, of an issue, which is probably a whole webinar in itself. Okay, so <laughs> I'll let you get back to the stable flies then. Okay. Yeah, so stable flies, uh, the way you can tell you have stable flies and not something else, you don't have to get down with a microscope and see what they look like. Stable flies are gonna cause your horses to stomp around. So they're gonna hang out on the legs and that's where your horses are you know, picking up their feet and stomping them down because they're biting flies. And they're one of the two flies that are pests of horses that are actually biting flies. Um, another way you can identify this fly is that it holds itself at a very different angle at about a 45 degree angle on the surface it's resting at. You don't have to get a protractor out and measure that, but just look at its head. If its head is pointing up a little bit, it's probably a stable fly versus a house fly that's gonna be very parallel to the base. So just some quick and easy ways to try and figure out what it is that you're dealing with. Stable flies, like most biting flies, are very visual animals. So they are looking for a broad uh, color spectrum that they identify as a moving animal. And so the ways that we manage stable flies are the same in some cases as our house flies, where we're looking for areas of waste, uh, which can be uh, shavings that you took out of a stall, waste shavings, and you put in a manure pile, they like to develop in that. Um, or the biggest culprit, especially out west and in the south, is, is round bale rings. So if you have round bales and feet in fields where the the waste has, the waste hay has kind of fallen down and horses are stomping on that and urinating and defecating in that area that is perfect stable fly development they're protected from the horse's hooves because of the layers of hay and they develop extremely well in those situations so moist wet areas clean those up uh, and they, you remove the the areas where they can develop however stable flies are very good flyers so if you have a neighbor uh, even a couple miles down the road that is not very good at cleaning their space up, you still may have stable flies. And in that case, we look to traps. Most of the traps sold are for house flies that probably familiar with the jug traps, which have this, the smells. Um, stable flies are visual, like I said, so they have a lot of um, sticky traps. And a couple of them that are out there commercially being sold are bite-free. It's called the bite-free trap and the other one's called the Olsen trap. Both of them work under the same principle where you put a, a sticky trap on a stake and the flies are attracted by the wavelengths of light coming off of those and they get stuck to it. You pick that up and toss it when it gets full and you add a new one. And if you put those around your pastures, you can generally attract quite a few stable flies and collect them before they even get to your animal. Um, stable flies and house flies, because they devel develop in such similar habitats, they can also be controlled with the use of parasitoids. And I know we're gonna talk about those a little bit later, so I'm gonna leave that for now. But parasitoids are a biocontrol method for managing stable flies. So cleaning up what you have is waste, adding some traps out there and adding parasitoids are the best ways to keep them off your animals. So with the, the colored sticky traps, do you want to place those near your horses or is that going to draw them near, draw the flies towards your horses or do you want them near your horses so that the, the insects find the traps because they're near your horses anyway? It's, that's, a great, uh, that's a great point. You don't want to put them in the pastures because if they don't get stuck on your horse and they're wearing them like a tiara, they may get stuck on something else, yeah. uh, like a deer or something that may come in that field and be very curious. And um, so ask me how I know is <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. definitely happened before. So unless you wanna build small electrified fences that to put them in, the best place to actually locate them is the fence line on the other side of the fence line, um, especially if you have wooden fence or, or PVC fence, Stable flies love to rest on fence lines after they've taken a blood meal. So if you put them by those fence lines, the next time they get up to take a blood meal, they're gonna say, well, this thing's a lot closer and jump to that instead of going into the field and on your horses. So we have a question from Linda in West End, North Carolina, and she wants to know, is there a fly spray that actually works? And we have a question from our live audience from Rodrigo who wants to know what are the best active components in insect repellents for horses? So like, this is the big question. What right. actually wor works um, as a spray to, to get rid of uh, insects and flies? 
Yeah, that's <laughs> that is. That's I get that question one. a lot. You know, yeah. there's so many out there. You walk into a tractor supplier or whatever, and they're all over the place. You know, which one is actually going to be? Do I get the expensive one or not? Um, and so I got that question so many times that I actually had an undergrad come to me in animal science and say, "Hey, I want to do a research project." And I said, "This is a good one. Let's do this." Um, and obviously, we couldn't test every single one of them. But to give a little bit of uh, broad perspective, the vast majority of what we call active ingredients, so the, the pieces of that fly repellent that actually are what's making the flies go away, um, are pyrethroids. So most of them are synthetic. You do have some natural, um, nat natural products as well, but most of them are synthetic pyrethroids. And the reason that they use those is horses don't typically tolerate synthetic chemicals very well. They don't even tolerate pyrethroids very well. So our doses of permethrin, for example, that we put on horses are pretty minimal compared to what they pour on cows, for example. So we may have a, a 1% or 2% and cattle are getting a 10%. Um, so the, the horses actually get a bit of dermatitis. They, if you've ever tried to use a cattle one, you'd, you'd see them flake. Uh, and that's we don't want that to happen either. So it is a bit of a challenge. Um, because those are really have been our options and house flies in particular, but stable flies and some of these other pests of livestock have really quick development time. So they turn over every five to seven days, there's a new generation. And because of that resistance against these chemical active ingredients is really common. So you've probably noticed that if you buy Bronco, for example, off the shelf and you spray it on your horse, it may look like the fly drops to the ground, shakes itself off, and then gets right back up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're not crazy. That's actually what's happening because they have developed resistance. The other problem with a lot of the pyrethroid products is that they tend to be contact repellents, which means the, the fly actually has to land on your horse to get a dose of that and then fall off. It's not a spatial repellent, which is actually keeping them away from the area that your horse occupies. So. When we tested the products, we looked at um, several that were pyrethroid, so, so, and they were different doses, so Bronco, Ultra Shield Red, Endure, Optiforce, uh, and there was another one I think that we did, um, against some natural products, uh, EcoVet, uh, Smart Packs Outsmart, and Equiderma, all of which use different natural ingredients, what we call natural ingredients, um, but they don't use anything synthetic. And we actually found much to our surprise that those natural products worked far better and longer than any of our synthetics. So really? they were all about the same up until about an hour. And then some of our higher dose pyrethroids would last about four hours, but uh, EcoVet was actually the only one that would last a solid two hours. Now, I want to put a little bit of an asterisk with this, that this was in the lab. We didn't have it on a horse. We weren't looking at how UV light affects this or if it rains, <laughs> if it's going to work, or if the horse rolls or sweats. Um, but just having that in a space, uh, the, our, our natural products were deterrents for the fly. So uh, they actually killed themselves before they would land on, <laughs> on the product where we had them sprayed. So it was like double benefit. It was great. Um, <laughs> So, so, so I was really excited when you said that the natural products work better, but then I heard you say two hours. So, so yeah, so they, so they were all about the same until about, about an hour, hour and a half or so. And then okay. it was only the natural products that lasted longer than that. So okay. again, EcoVet, Outsmart, Equiderma were the three that we tested and EcoVet was the only one that lasted a full 48 hours. So two days. Oh, okay. So it's not yeah. every two hours that I need to go reapply. Because no. there have been certain products that I've used that it has, it's felt like that. Like yes. a couple hours, it's not working anymore. Okay, let's re reapply. And I feel like I could spend all day um, being, <laughs> putting it up. Life spray on my horses. Yeah. Right. So. And that's, uh, a, that's a good point as well, is, is putting fly spray on. Um, so when you apply a fly spray, they usually sell them in spray formation uh, mm -hmm. where you pick it up and it's ready to go and you spray it on a horse and off you go and your horse is dancing around because most of them don't like to be sprayed. <laughs> and so you're not you're you're actually putting a good chunk of that product out into the environment and it's not actually getting on your horse. 
So there are some kind of best management practices to use when you're putting on repellents that can help with one, keeping it to work as long as it can and be the most effective and be your bottom line in terms of dollar, not wasting products. So a lot of the issue with EcoVet has come down to the odor. Uh, it's very, very strong um, and, and horses and people don't necessarily like to have that around them if they're in the barn. And so I've recommended for all sprays across the board that you use a mitt and actually apply it with a mitt. So you can use a self-tanner mitt or a microfiber mitt and spray the product or pour the product on that mitt and wipe your horse down. So this ensures 100% contact and anywhere that you've touched with that mitt and you can get it everywhere you wanna go. Um, so if you read the label instructions and that's really important, it suggests almost every single repellent suggests thorough coverage over your animal on a clean horse and it is vital that people remember that this is not going to work very well if your horse is caked in mud um, if it rains you're going to have to put it back on if they roll you're going to have to put it back on that's just the nature of repellents but um, if you do apply with a mitt you're, you're ensuring a more thorough coverage than just a spray okay and so when you say thorough how thorough do you mean <laughs> right how, how much like is there should the coat be saturated where you can see that it's on them or is it just a mist well I guess with the mitt it's rubbing them but are you needing to then rub every inch of the horse how much do you need to be applying right so I always I always think about it when I when I'm putting this on as I'm wiping the horse down getting ready to go into the show ring right so you're just trying to take all those top layers of dust off and so you're covering most of the exposed places that you can you can see it doesn't have to be everywhere there are some places that flies don't typically like to be or to bite such as between the back legs um, if you are trying to control for ticks for example that that may be a little bit different you may want to put repellents between those legs and, and on the chest and under the jaw. So it depends on what you are focusing on. For best coverage, you're going to want to put it everywhere. In terms of the amount, um, there's, there's really no way to gauge amount. You don't want them to be soaking wet and dripping, but if you apply it to that mitt, so you know it's there, you can see it on the mitt, the mitt is wet, and then wipe it down over the animal and maybe do that for each half of each side of the horse, so four times, uh, four separate times, that should be about the right amount, just making sure that you have contact everywhere. Now, we have a couple of follow-up questions back to the fly traps for you from yeah. our live audience. So Roger's in the live audience, and he wants to know if the sticky traps uh, should be placed in the sun or the shade, does it matter? The sun is always a good place to put things for um, all pest flies, but for biting flies. They don't typically like to hang out in the shade. Okay, and then we have a question from Brad in our live audience, and he's curious if sticky trap uh, fly traps have an attractant, and if so, will they attract even more flies from farther away? That is, uh, will you end up attracting more flies if you weren't, than if you weren't using the traps? It's, a very wise question, um, and I always talk to people about bug zappers, for example, and say, you know, bug zappers are best placed in your neighbor's yard. Uh, yeah. So the <laughs> the idea is there, um, and it makes sense, but in this case, they are not attractant based, they're visual based. So the, the flies have to perceive that they're there, and in order to do that, they need to be there on in that area to begin with. So you're not going to be bringing them from you know, the neighbor's farm or a mile down the road, they're going to be controlling the flies that are in that space. And you may find you need more than one depending on the size of your property and, and what your infestation level is. So as far as the smelly traps go, are those useful for horses? Because I have to say my, my neighbor does have a smelly trap out by uh, their chickens and it took me a while to figure out that it wasn't something dead <laughs> in that <laughs> corner of my property and then I was like oh finally oh it's, oh, it's that's a, a trap yeah it, are those worth it are those worth the smell so I'm assuming you're talking about the the bag or jug traps is that yeah. right okay yeah, it was a bag trap yeah yeah so those are uh, useful for House flies in particular although face flies will come to them as well they are useful um, 
even though it may seem like they're not, but the challenge in terms of, you know, like the cost benefit ratio of using them <laughs> versus yeah. smelling them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the challenge with them is again, using them correctly. And now it seems like it's pretty simple. You put the attractant in the water, you hang them up and you let the flies come to the, to the jug or the bag or whatever the case may be. And that's what exactly what happens, but you need to watch your levels of flies and um, not let them go any longer than a week because what will happen, especially if you have high fly numbers, if you get too many flies in there that build up kind of a fly raft, you can actually have other flies come in and lay their eggs in there and they will actually develop on the cadavers of the dead flies. That is um, so gross. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And it's really nasty when it happens and it's even worse that it's just horrifying. So, <laughs> so, so you just wanna make sure that those are being replaced on a pretty regular basis. Okay, so we have a question from Dana in Santa Margarita, California, and she wants to know if, if fly sprays for our horses are dangerous for, uh, are, are not dangerous for horses, then why can't we use them on ourselves? Why would they be dangerous for humans to use? That is a really good question, especially when we talk about pyrethroids. And this comes up a lot with tick control with people, especially in the East Coast where we have Lyme disease and, and folks are trying to continuously protect themselves against tick bites. Um, pyrethroids inherently are not dangerous to mammals. We have a pretty high tolerance and most of it gets excreted through urine when we have contact with it, but we want to make sure we don't have overdoses of pyrethroids. And that's from the human perspective. And so different mammals have different tolerance levels for pyrethroids. I talked a little bit earlier about how cattle have a, a much higher tolerance than horses do, at least when we talk about skin abrasions or, or dermatitis with pyrethroids. And the same thing is with people. So, so the higher percentage of pyrethroids that we have or that, that we apply, the more likely it is that we're gonna have skin reactions or potentially other reactions to them, uh, especially in susceptible populations. So it's not necessarily that the, the active ingredient is dangerous, it is the dosage that is um, a challenge for, to use from horse to human or cattle to horse. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, our next question is from Cindy in Ontario, Canada, and she wants to know what she can use as a safe fly control method for her nursing broodmares with the babies. Right, so that um, all insecticides have to go through a registration process, and that's with the EPA. And on those labels, we have they have these big kind of scary looking labels that it looks like a lot to read, but I recommend everybody reads the labels of every product you ever apply, even if it seems redundant, just so you know what it is labeled for, how to dispose of it safely, what to do if you have a child that drinks it accidentally or, or whatever the case may be. And on those labels, you will find what's safe and what's not. Uh, if you don't see it on the label, they often will have contact information where you can contact the company and ask them directly and they will let you know if they have done those studies on, on efficacy and safety for nursing or pregnant broodmares. Um, our next question is from Mary in North Garden, Virginia, and this is a question I had as well. She, she would like any information that you might have on insect repellents without pesticides that, that would kill pollinators. So those of us who have our bee gardens and are happy to have our little bumblebees around right. uh, pollinating, what suggestions you have for then controlling uh, insects around our horses? Right, so when you're using repellents, ideally, and, and ideally you'd be applying them, as I said earlier, with a mitt and not spraying them into the environment. So that's, that's one way you can mitigate some of the risks to local environmental, um, you know, beneficials or pollinators or whatever's out there. You don't wanna be putting more pyrethroids in the water. There are certain aquatic animals that are more susceptible to pyrethroids, cats, Cats are not very, uh, they don't tolerate pyrethroids well. So by just putting putting repellents on correctly or putting them directly on your animal, you're gonna reduce the risk to non-targets. Um, the biggest issue that I see on a lot of commercial farms is the use of automatic sprayers. 
Um, so these are very common in some areas where, and I'm sure everyone's familiar mm -hmm. with at least hearing of them, where you have the spray systems in the barns and they go off every so often. And the idea is that you are creating an environment that keeps flies out um, and off the horses. But what this is, is really indiscriminately applying pyrethroids generally, because that's usually what's being added into the environment and, and it's getting on the horses, it's getting on the people, uh, whether or not there are flies currently there or not. So this is a problem in two ways. One, because you are increasing the risk of resistance to these chemicals that the flies have. And then uh, the other problem is, like you mentioned, the potential for non-target. So this is where the risks to beneficial insects, even in the barn, like our parasitoids come in, um, but those can also kind of waft out of the barn and, and find their find themselves in places that are putting other things at risk as well. Yeah. So I recommend that those are not used. And, and keep in mind that not all natural or quote natural insecticides are safe for pollinators either. Um, just because it says it's natural doesn't mean that it's always good. Arsenic is natural. That doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> yeah. So we want to be sure that um, we are carefully managing all repellents the same way, regardless if it's synthetic or not. So if you have beautiful flower baskets hanging from your barn, be extra careful with what you're spraying into the environment then. Right. Yep. Um, our next question is from Claire in Ontario, Canada, and she wants to know, are there any essential oils that have been scientifically proven to be effective for fly um, or mosquito control? Okay, so um, if we go back to those I, uh, three natural products, that is literally the only <laughs> time that anybody's looked at horse uh, horse products and fly control, whether that's mosquitoes, because mosquitoes are flies, or these other what we call filth flies, which are house stable flies, space flies. Um, so the short answer is essential oils have been looked at for fly control, but not for use on horses. Um, in use on horses, Equiderma is one that has been used, and those have uh, that product has several essential oils in it. Um, and so, yes, it is effective for about 24 hours, a little longer than 24 hours. That particular product was really effective uh, for house flies. Specifically for mosquitoes, it was not tested, but I will add, so it's a little asterisk, but I will add that mosquitoes are a little bit less tolerant of um, of these oils than house flies are. So they, they tend to leave before the house flies do. So chances are it probably will be at least somewhat effective for mosquitoes as well, if not more effective. We have a question from Summer in Ohio, and she says that she used a natural spray on her horse on a hot day, and it seemed to have burned her horse's skin. How can she know that a natural spray is safe to use on her horse? So natural products, if they haven't got, so, okay, backing up a little bit, natural products are usually deemed by the EPA to be of minimal risk because they, they're not synthetic. Um, so they don't often go through the full, or they don't have to go through the full EPA safety process. So any natural products that you buy that haven't gone through that process, we're not going to know what it's going to do to your horse under every circumstance because it hasn't been tested. If it's a natural product that includes an oil of any kind, those are going to be at higher risk for burns in, in sunlight. As with most oils, if you put it on your body, it's going to heat up faster and it may cause burning. So if you do have a horse that may be particularly sensitive to that or um, maybe has some white areas uh, that are a little bit more prone to sunburns, you're going to be you're going to want to be a little bit more careful, um, but that is a little bit of a risk with some of these natural products that we, we don't always have good safety data for them. Uh, our next question is from Mary in Missouri, and she wants to know about fly predators. Are they safe, uh, and can there be an overgrowth of them, and can they create any problems? So can you talk to us a little bit about what a fly predator is and how they might be used to control uh, other flies? Uh, around our horses? I would love to. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. 
So I was exposed to fly predators, I'll, I'll use that term, um, before I was even in graduate school and I did the same as most horse, horse owners and said, well, these look kind of interesting, let me, let me try these. Um, and was fortunate enough to be able to study them uh, for my graduate student work and I've continued to do so since. So they're one of my favorite topics. Um, so fly predators or fly assassins as they're called in some other, <laughs> some other companies, uh, they all have their own word for them, but they're actually wasps. And I don't want anybody to freak out. They're not gonna sting anybody. They're itty bitty little wasps um, that you're never gonna see once you release them. And that's because they're off doing their job. They're the good guys. Uh, they are not dangerous in any way. They are actually native and they're present in the environment at about three to five percent of the, the flies that are, uh, or the eggs that are laid actually end up producing parasitoids instead of, um, they're called parasitoid wasps, but uh, they produce parasitoids instead of flies. So they hang out in the environment at a really low level. And the reason that that happens and why they don't get really high numbers is because it's not really in their benefit as a population to kill all of their hosts because then they die. So they never really, uh, they never really get to high levels. Their development cycle is about three times to four times longer than the fly. So they're not naturally going to take down populations of flies. And that's why they're sold commercially. So when folks buy them, they are participating in what we call augmentative releases. So that means we're adding things to the environment that are already naturally there. And so we overload the environment because we know that that development time takes a while and we pressure those flies back. Uh, they will not take over in the environment because again, they once they have that next generation and there's not enough flies for them to parasitize and continue on, they'll leave. They'll go find, they'll go in the woods and they'll go find other naturally occurring flies. They're not specialists on flies that, that are pests of horses. So they'll, they'll leave and we have to continually apply them to the environment to make sure that they maintain high enough levels to keep the fly population down. So that's kind of biology in a nutshell. Um, is there anything else specifically that you're thinking yeah. about? It just makes me think of like releasing um, ladybugs for the aphid populations and then they all just disappear. <laughs> so <laughs> That's exactly, they're not going to hang out and starve to death. They're going to try and find something else. So, okay. um, so that's definitely so, why, it's why we have to keep buying them. <laughs> it's yeah, not just, just, it's not just a consumer thing. It's not the company saying, yeah, you should keep buying them. It's actually a biological reason. Yeah. So are there specific flies that those are targeting? Yes, yeah, so uh, there are specific flies they're targeting and specific species of parasitoids, so fly predators, that you need to be focused on to target the flies that you want. So starting with the flies, they are particularly good at controlling stable and house flies. Um, they will not control face flies because face flies have a kind of a protective armor when they're developing that the parasitoids can't get in. Um, so we're not going to worry so much about them, but if you have house or stable flies, they definitely will, will parasitize them. Um, and in terms of the species of parasitoid, we have a couple different species and nobody really needs to know what, they, what those are that work, but you need to know the ones that don't work because there are some companies that try and sell you those. Uh, and that is um, called Nasonia, so they're the jewel wasps. It sounds super fancy, they're very pretty. Mm -hmm but they actually prefer a very, very different group of flies that most horse farms are not gonna have unless they have a lot of dead animals hanging around. So, okay. so, so they're for something completely different. Um, so there are a few companies that do sell Nasonia that will not work. Uh, and they're pretty high profile companies. So my best advice is to ask the company what species are you selling and they can speak in a, a different language but as long as they don't say nasonia you're pretty good to go okay. so kelly in magnolia texas is interested in using fly predators and she wants to know if she can use them in correlation with other standard fly sprays as well yes fly sprays uh, are absolutely fine and even if you do have the the overhead spray systems, most of the time they'll, the parasitoids will be able to get out of the way. But again, I do recommend for this, their safety uh, that those are removed. Um, but fly repellents for sure are absolutely safe. 
Uh, we have a question from our live audience. Diana has been told that a vinegar and water spray can work for a few hours for keeping flies away, and that eating garlic or adding garlic powder to feed for your horse can also help. Is there any evidence to support either of these um, tools or, is, and is there anything that should be concerning any side effects? Yeah, so unfortunately there's no evidence to support either one. Um, the garlic uh, myth has been going around for a while um, and garlic has been used for many different things for probably thousands of years, but but for fly control, there is no evidence to suggest that it can be fed to control flies. And actually, the, the couple studies that have been done have been working with mosquitoes when they absolutely found no evidence. So um, garlic feed-throughs for horses are not recommended for fly control. Uh, in terms of side effects, there, there surely are uh, side effects with garlic. Uh, horses actually can become anemic because of the addition of garlic to their diet. So it is something that if you are going to try it for, you know, if you just, if you want to see if it works for your animal, just consult with your veterinarian and let them know that this is going on and keep a close eye on your animal because again, it, it can, anemia can happen with garlic additions. Um, the vinegar and water is one of those that I wish, I wish it was that simple. I really do. <laughs> it would be great if we could just have vinegar and water, but unfortunately they're they're a bit more tolerant of lots of things that stink really badly. Um, and I guess that's why they're called filth flies. So, <laughs> so it's, 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 not, uh, it's not the best option. <laughs> yeah. So Linda is in our live audience and she's curious about the best way to control uh, what she calls manure gnats, those little small bugs that are always buzzing around the fresher manure piles. What are those little bugs and uh, what can we do about them? Right. So. The um, there are about 20,000 species of flies in the United States. So again, we're only talking about a very small number, and most of them are very beneficial. So they either are pollinators or decomposers, and those tiny gnats are in that decomposer realm. So those guys are actually good guys. We want them there because the faster that manure is broken down, that means the less is available for the bad flies, the house and stable flies, to develop. Um, so there's really no need to control them. There are things you can do to clean them up and move them. So you can move manure, say if it's uh, in the driveway or, or a trailway, you can um, put it in the woods or you can move it into a manure bucket or put it in a, uh, a manure spreader or something to contain them into a localized area, but it would not behoove us to control them completely because then we're taking away some of our our biggest friends in terms of decomposing uh, that waste. We have a follow-up question to the parasitic wasps um, from our live audience. Sarah would like to know if the fly predators are worth using in an environment where there are farms that are very close to each other and you know that you're the only one using them. That is a wonderful question and we run into that problem so often because you can do everything in your control to control flies and, and it's your neighbors that are the problem. So this is, uh, there's a multifaceted approach to this. So in IPM, uh, the parasitoids work very well if we can include other methods as well. So sanitation, so that's cleaning up, like I mentioned before, cleaning up those round bales, cleaning up your manure pile. And the parasitoids are really good at getting to the places that we can't reach. So in between those stall mats that we don't always think about cleaning really well, um, or the spilled feed that got, kind of got wet in the corner, they'll take care of those guys. If you have neighbors that are producing the flies and you know that because you're super clean and you've checked for development in these different areas or you don't have high risk areas, you spread all your manure and you don't have round bales and so you're pretty confident it's coming from your neighbors, um, you can always put traps up, that's always helpful. But I do recommend, and this is always hard because people are, you know, it's not my fault, but I recommend that you work with your neighbors and come up with a comprehensive area-wide approach. We're dealing with this a lot with ticks and tick control. It's not just one house that controls ticks. It's gonna be the whole neighborhood that has to get together. So it can be a challenge, I understand that. I, and especially um, with horse folks, with individual businesses, it can be a real challenge to get everybody together. But if you can all get on the same plan, you may notice that your, your populations go down quite significantly. In terms of whether or not it's worth it to use the parasitoids, again, it just depends on, um, 
on your particular uh, cost benefit ratio and you know if you need to control things from your farm as well as the neighbors then you may want to use it and set up traps um, so it, it really depends on your personal preferences there and, and what you're willing to spend in, in fly control if you put out the parasitoids and you don't see them working don't use them anymore it's obviously not going to work for your particular situation and, and you can bring in some other control methods um, we have a question from Janet in Southern Pines, North Carolina, and she wants to know if some horses just attract more flies than others. She said she has a, a black pony who seems to have flies all over her while the other horses don't. And she says black. I've known uh, you, it always seems to me like the blonde horses have more flies than others. Are, is that true or, or are, what are we noticing as horse owners? Yeah, so that, that brings up a really cool part about arthropod ecology that I'm probably the only person right now that's really excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, uh, this is something that happens with parasites across the board. We have something called the 80-20 rule or Pareto rule where you have 80% of your parasites that end up on 20% of your population. Now for flies, it doesn't always end up coming up that, that much of a distinct difference, but you do see them kind of harass certain individuals more than others. And part of that has to do with how flies perceive life, how they look at their environment. And um, I guess this is a really good point, a really good time to bring up the, the zebra stripes since we're talking about fly eyesight, uh, that recently they've been looking at the evolution of zebra stripes and why zebra stripes exist. Um, and recently in the past year or two, they have actually identified uh, reasons why they think the zebra stripe exists is to deter biting flies. So black horses, dark horses, tend to attract more flies than white horses do. And if you break up the black pattern with white stripes, you still get the flies coming into land, but they get really confused right before they land and take off and go a different direction. And it's like the, the change in uh, polarity of the light actually messes with their sight. They can't figure out what's going on uh, and they end up flying away. So yeah, you're seeing the dark animals or um, or animals that have solid coats. Those are going to get more flies than your, your white animals. But something really cool that I just thought they did for fun, which was producing these fly sheets that are zebra stripes, I didn't realize they were actually highly beneficial. Mm -hmm. So we can throw on a zebra stripe blanket or, or fly sheet on these animals and start to deter some of these flies just by changing their color. Um, we have some follow-up questions from our live audience. We have Patty and Sylvia both have questions about feed-through fly control. Patty would like to know if uh, Solitude IGR is safe for horses, uh, is safe to feed to horses, and Sylvia would like to know if feed-through fly control methods just in general, if they work. Yes, so there are two major feed-throughs for horses. One is Solitude and the other is Simplify. They are two different active ingredients, but they do kind of the same thing, which is prevent the flies from actually completing their development. It's very specific for flies, so it's not gonna influence any um, beneficial beetles that may be in the manure, so it's very fly-specific, and it is very safe for horses. Um, so the, the compound actually gets into the, the manure, and as those flies develop in the manure, they can actually complete their development and turn into adults. It works only if every horse in your facility is on it, because if you have some that are on it and some that are not, well, the flies are gonna lay eggs in all of it and half of it's gonna have flies developing and half isn't. So you wanna make sure for best use that you do have every horse in the facility on it. So if you're a border that may be a little bit more difficult uh, than if you have your own facility. Uh, again, this goes back to the other question about whether it's worth it if you're nearby other farms where there's flies. I do think it's worth it in this case because you know that you are preventing fly development on your facility and then your backup fly methods or integrated methods will then be trapping flies coming in. And so in that case, you'd put up fly traps around the perimeter where you think the flies are coming in to intercept them before they end up on your property. So it is um, useful in, circum in certain circumstances uh, and, and um, is very safe. We have um, 
a link that our web producer Jennifer has shared with our live audience if they're interested in learning more about the research around the zebra stripes and horseflies. And it's at thehorse.com slash 137059. So if you're listening, that's the link to get to it. And if you are with us live, you can click on that link and see that article. It's it's a pretty interesting one that I know got a lot of traffic. People really enjoyed it. Um, we have a question from our live audience. Uh, it's from Brad, and he would like to know your advice for controlling ticks. He'll be moving into an area that has ticks, and whereas he's had not, he hasn't had to deal with them where he currently lives. Yeah, so ticks are a big one. Um, and here in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is kind of ground zero for incidents of Lyme disease. So we're always very worried, um, not only for people, but for dogs and horses, which uh, also get Lyme disease and have symptoms of Lyme disease. Um, so the best things to do are pretty much the same as what we do for people. Your first line of defense is to conduct tick checks. Um, so there's a couple different ticks that are that are horse oriented, I guess, that you can find on horses. And I will have to beg forgiveness because I am much more biased towards the eastern part of the country than the western part. Um, but dog ticks, which are found in most areas of the country, are, are um, found on horses pretty commonly. And then black-legged ticks, we have both a Pacific black-legged tick um, or the western black-legged tick and eastern black-legged tick um, also will get on horses. Um, which are the ones that vector Lyme disease. So you want to do tick checks on your horses, which is looking around the chest area between the legs, um, between the buttocks, and then under the, the chin area. They like to hang out under the jowls of the horse. So just doing a tick check every time you see your animals. Now, for some people who have brood mares and they don't handle their horses every day, that can be a bit of a challenge. So pasture maintenance can actually help quite a bit. So keeping pastures mowed uh, relatively short, if you can, will reduce the humidity levels in the grass, which makes ticks go way down lower or, or not be in an area at all because of how, how humid and hot it can get in those little microclimates. Uh, moving pasture fences away from wooded fence lines so the horses aren't going to be near the fence lines. CDC recommends this for people as well, that you have about a three-yard barrier between the woods and where you work and play and recreate outside and the same thing can work for horses so moving that fence line in um, can be very helpful clearing out what we call uh, rodent hotels so taking down any uh, stone walls or moving dead logs uh, cutting branches back you're just making the space brighter sunnier which reduces the areas that the ticks can survive they need pretty high humidity uh, so all of those can really help and then repellents are actually much better for ticks than for flies because ticks haven't developed the same resistance. So using even uh, pyrethroid products on horses can be very effective. They also sell fly boots that are laced with uh, pyrethroids that can be used. Um, and uh, Equispot is actually one that the, the spot treatment of pyrethroids can be used. My vet has recommended, and I am not recommending this, but I am recommending that folks ask their veterinarians about the use of fipronil sprays. Fipronil is labeled for use on dogs, um, but in some cases has been recommended for use on horses. So ask your veterinarian if you're in a high risk area, whether or not that would be a suitable treatment method or not treatment method, but preventative method for uh, tick control on horses. Fipronil is the same stuff you find in frontline. Okay. So if you do find the ticks on your horse, then what do you do? How do you get them off? Good question. Same same principle for horses as it is for people and dogs. You want to remove them ideally with a sharp pair of forceps. And this is no fire, no gasoline, no Vaseline, no nail polish remover, just a pair of forceps. That's all you need. And the key here is that you grab that tick as close to the base of the horse's skin as you can and pull gently and slowly up to remove it. You don't want to squeeze the tick anywhere other than by the mouth parts. It doesn't matter if you leave the mouth parts in, that's, that's an old wives tale. But you don't want to squeeze the tick because what you're doing if you squeeze the abdomen or anywhere else but really close to the base is you're actually pushing potential pathogens into the hole that the tick has already created. So you don't want to do that for sure. You want to make sure that you're trying to minimize the risk as much as possible. And I always recommend once you've removed a tick that you put it in a plastic bag, you date it and label it, 
throw it in the freezer, warn any roommates or spouses or children that you have that that's what it is. Uh, so if your horse isn't acting quite right and you have the, the vet out uh, and it has a fever maybe and it's unexpected, that you have that tick that you may be able to test if they can't accurately diagnose what's going on because diagnosing tick-borne diseases are very, very tough. Mm -hmm. uh, so having the tick available to get tested is a huge help to veterinarians if they just don't know what's happening. Our next question is from Carolyn in Seebeck, Washington, and she wants to know what the best fly control methods are for mixed herds that have both horses and cows in them. That's a hard one. We have that actually at the barn where my horse is. We have cows and yaks and cacks and sheep and a pig and <laughs> all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So we have the spectrum of flies for sure. Um, and so in those situations where you, you really have all possibilities of fly development, um, this is really where you want to implement an integrated pest management plan. So you're going to have to attack flies from many different angles. And something we didn't talk too much about, but I can add here now, is uh, pasture maintenance for flies. So two of the major pests of flies, horn flies and face flies, can only develop in cattle manure. They will not develop in horse manure. So if you have them, uh, it's because your neighbors have cows or someone nearby has cows or you have cows. When you and say nearby, how, how close is a nearby? Yeah, so anywhere up to about eight miles, sometimes Gosh. even farther, I know, depending Shoot. on weather patterns. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so if you're in a rural area and somebody has mm -hmm. cows, you may not even know, but yeah. chances are, well, not chances are, they're coming from somebody with cows. Um, so unfortunately, if you do have horn flies and you don't have cows and you have face flies and you don't have cows, um, you're going to have to deal with, with managing the adults because there's nothing else you can do. But if you do have cattle, you can help the situation by um, some pasture maintenance. So breaking up, dragging fields frequently, and by frequently, I mean every week or so, um, five to seven days, depending on the temperature. You're breaking up that manure and you are creating more surface area to dry out, which kills the developing flies. So you'll no longer have the flies being able to emerge because they've run out of water, basically. Uh, so that is one of the biggest things you can do. Uh, horn flies are, are pretty crazy because they will actually start to lay eggs in the manure coming from a cow that hasn't even finished defecating yet. It's that fresh. Like that's, <laughs> that's how fresh it has to be. So, uh, and it takes, it takes a, not very long for them to complete their development. So you really need to be out there doing pasture maintenance pretty frequently. But if you can do that, then you can manage a lot of the, the horn fly and face fly population. The other big issue that comes up with cattle in particular is the round bales. That seems to be a pretty frequent addition to uh, cattle herds. Um, and managing round bales is fairly simple in that if you just put up round bale rings, like the, the metal rings that go around it, uh, to prevent that waste hay from falling down, and then you move where you're putting those round bales every single time, it allows it to uh, dry out so you get less development in those areas as well. We have a question from Anna in our live audience, and she's curious about your recommendations for controlling deer and horse flies. And so when I hear deer and horse flies, I'm thinking like those really big ones that bite and make your horse buck. <laughs> yes. Matt, is that, um, is that a clear picture of that? Yep. Am I correct? Yep. I know exactly okay. what you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. Um, so in our little subset of, of uh, expertise, we call those tabanid flies. They're a specific family. So yeah, horse and deer flies are major biters. Um, horse and deer flies are an interesting case because they are not, they're associated with livestock, but they're not produced by livestock. So there's nothing that you're doing or your neighbors are doing that's creating a horse or deer fly problem. They develop in marshy areas or streams or pond edges. Um, and so if you're nearby any of those areas, you're likely to have them. Managing them isn't as straightforward because you're not producing that, that habitat, but it can be done. There are a couple commercial traps for them. Uh, one is called the horse pal. Another one's called the Eps trap. Uh, and there's also one called the H trap. And those two of those are available commercially through sites like Dover Saddlery, or I think Smart Pack has them as well. Uh, the H-Trap is its own supplier. 
and they operate on the principle that these flies are very visual and they see these uh, one has a big black ball that sways in the wind and it's supposed to represent the, the hind end of a horse <laughs> another one is a big like tarp dark colored tarp that's supposed to look like the side of an animal uh, and they fly into these and they get trapped and then you remove them and you start over so these flies tend to be very territorial and so if you can set them up in areas where they uh, you, they seem to be coming from or in the pastures that seem to be hit the most, uh, you can get better uh, better control from them. And then when you're on the trail, again, the use of something like EcoVet uh, or another product, making sure to apply it pretty thoroughly can help deter them from landing on your animal. And then for yourself, using something like DEET can definitely <laughs> <Yeah>. help. <laughs> yeah, and it does seem like those, uh, well, I live in the desert, so it's when I'm up in the mountains near the lakes that those yeah. really nasty deer flies and the big ones, and then yeah, and um, and then the horses start bucking and scrambling, and yes, it's, they're really awful. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for tonight. It went by really quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I learned a ton. Thank you, Dr. McTinger, for joining us. Uh, great answers, and I, I I think everyone probably took home some tips that they can use uh, at their own places. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. This was fun. <laughs> um, I hope that all of you listening can join us next month when we're going to be talking about managing horses in the summer heat. Until then, from all of us here at The Horse, have a great night.